either. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to make you host. Okay. I'm not as familiar with this UI on the phone. Well, now I can perform the functions uh, if you tell me what you want me to do. Okay, you are now host, Barry, and I am a nobody now. Okay. So I can admit people and anything else you want. That's right. You can admit yeah. people, you can actually ban people, you can actually uh, stop the recording, you can actually do anything until you terminate the session. Okay, and if you want to, if you need to send me instructions on text, I can monitor the, uh, the messenger. Let's see, here comes Joshua. Heiner, how are you today? Well, fine. 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 But as long as I'm there, I have a question. In in which point and how uh, do you enable transcriptions? I cannot see it in my menus of Zoom, or I haven't found it yet. And what, uh, where do you do it? If you're on the desktop app, it's at the bottom. It's very easy to find. If you're on the phone, you have to look at the uh, three dot 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 uh, menu. And it's called live transcript. Okay, I tried to find it in a parallel session. I don't want to uh, take more of your time. I think you also have to um, sign up with otter to have it available on your zoom account it's not i don't know if it's automatic now or but it used to be that you had to um go to otter and link link the live transcript to your zoom account so if you haven't done that it may not be yet available i don't think i have to do that though barry it's automatic now because they bought it the Otter is still sending me a request to connect it with my Zoom account, and I haven't done it, and I still get live transcripts. Okay. That is also my information. Otter is an add-on option when you better want to um, modify the transcript or uh, when you use other systems. Yeah, so anyway, Heiner, uh, you probably were not around when yesterday I said uh, I had slept all day Friday because I just got my second booster. So uh -huh. I didn't get anything done on Friday and nothing done on Saturday also. So there's a lot I have to catch up on. So I just wanted to say that the proposal I had was to structure a session using this Sunday time with a bit more agreements in place. So I'm actually gonna you know, make sure that we have shared group memory and I've started uh, GitHub repositories already. There's about a handful already there. So if you look at GitHub under an organization called Global Challenges Collaboration, I'll send the link later. You can mm -hmm. already find those repos. And first thing first, and I'm about halfway through this, is I'm creating repos for each of the nine artifacts that I have in my nine artifacts blog. And that blog itself has already been uh, migrated over to uh, Global Challenges Collaboration Organization in GitHub. Okay. So as soon as I have all nine, I wanted to go through the next exercise, which is I would like for people to consider those behaviors that I have uh, asked people to participate with for the last four years or so, and really kind of as a group derive how we want to engage, whether we want to interrupt, whether we want to have, you know, single point monologues, whether or not we want to have time limits on speeches, 
whether or not we want to check in, whether or not we want to check out, whether or not we want to capture action items, et cetera, et cetera. And rather than me saying, this is what we're going to do, I'd like for all of us to actually have some consideration of that and then draft it up as an RFC slash rules of engagement slash charter. We can also do the same thing for our co-visioning. What is it that we are here, here to do? So anyway, all of that is in the plans. And because it all requires a little bit of preparation, um, you know, I'm, I'm sharing the work that I've got in progress if you want to go to GitHub, but it's not quite all done yet. So that's where I am. Over. Okay, please send the link of the GitHub because I'm invited for an evening or a dinner at 18 hours, so I won't stay long. Okay, I'll go find it and I'll post it right away. I'll give me a couple minutes. Okay, I think I just pasted it into the uh, Facebook Messenger chat for barn raising, but it wouldn't show me the link as I did it. So I'm going to go there and verify that it's yeah. the right link right now. Yes, it actually looks like the right link. So there is the organization link and under it, you should find several repos. They're skeletal at the moment, but uh, they're beginning to take shape along the nine artifacts blog. Yeah, it looks and like the next thing, uh, in addition to the behavior stuff is I'm gonna write up the RFC process, which already exists in a uh, Google doc but I'm going to translate it to uh, Markdown and put it into this repo. Are you uh, either of you, any of you, familiar with Markdown? Uh, is that a riff on Markup? Um, well, you could say yes, but it's basically the eighty percent of HTML in a very simplified format that kind of follows Emacs org mode, if you're familiar with that. Well, I haven't it's used way to, it's a way to get simple HTML rendered and basically a way to write structured documents. Uh -huh. You can do bullets, you can do headers, you can do tables, you can do links. That's pretty much, you know, the simple stuff you can do. And it's, you can learn it in five minutes. Okay, yeah, so very simplified HTML. Super yeah. simple HTML, yeah. Yep. So anyway, in GitHub, everything's in a markdown flavor of uh, document. Okay. Are you looking at it now, Barry Heiner? I have. I have it. I have your page up on my other monitor. 
just the main page. Anyway, you'll see that most of what's there is trying to follow the nine artifacts uh, structure. So yes, the house is rebooting. Yes, I'm on my phone. The power just came back recently. And so I haven't been able to prepare as I would have liked for a real full-on session. Not a problem. It's Mother's Day anyway, so. Oh yeah, that's right. I remember, I have a mother. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day to Casella. I'll tell her. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. I just had a curious question, Sam. I know there's a markdown language, and I think I've seen it. I understand it, but then there's mark up. And so I'm just curious the difference between a mark up and a down, like in commenting and stuff. How does that work? Well, the markup word, I think, really kind of got. Uh, known when XML became popular. And even XML was a derivative of SGML. And the ML in those acronyms always stood for markup language. And those languages were all very, very complete, very, very complex, very, very verbose. So when web developers decided to write up documents, my understanding is they wanted something super simple that just did the 80-20. And so they took the five or six or whatever, you know, small number of tags that really needed to be done. They just made them simple. Like a hash is level one, two hashes is level two, three hashes is level three. Uh, a single dash is a bullet point, you know, an indented dash is a second level bullet point. And that, by the way, all comes from Emacs org mode, which went all the way back to the like late 80s, early 90s, you know, something like that. So it was basically a way to do structured documents. In fact, you know, way even before uh, the web became popular. So it's a return to simplicity in my view. That's just my oh, own That's purpose. awesome. So markdown is just the most, the less amount of features that you need for a markup language. The minimum, yeah. The minimum, which is, you said six, is that right? I don't know what the exact number is, but you know, if okay. I can just say it's tags, it's tables, and it's lists of bullets. Yeah, I think that's about three things you got to learn. And there's probably a few more. Okay. But, you know, that's about Thank it. Thank you for telling me that. I never knew that. I always hear mark down. I know what mark up is. I just heard mark down and I never knew what delineated the two. So thank you, Sam. You're, that's my version of history, by the way. <laughs> but yes, I was there for XML. I was there to see SGML. I was not there when SGML was created, but uh, XML definitely. And XML was definitely very verbose. I'll be right back. I'm going to, my sister just uh, wants to talk and I'm going to wish her a happy Mother's Day and I'll be right back. Hey, Alex. Howdy. I found XML files on my system. I think I saved a I saved a blog post or something to my computer and it, it copied itself as an XML file. So I can open it in the browser. <clears throat> hey, can I introduce a new topic? Sure, please. Just this morning, I got two or three reminders from Facebook or notifications from Facebook saying that our good friend, He Gaia Kim, AKA Martin Pariso, yeah. has put two or three more comments on one of my posts in Global Challenges Collaboration. You want me to go look at him? I was just curious what you guys thought of it. He says that uh, for some reason we're attacking him. I'm not even communicating with him. I'm ignoring him. Um, maybe he's saying I'm attacking him, maybe. Oh. <laughs> he's, uh, he's got a complex. If he didn't have a complex before, he got one now. So you saw it, right, Alex? It, it's an ego. 
it's, it's defending, defend, jumping to the defense of your own ego because you've been exposed to some, some trauma or some stupid thinking. So in your reading, Alex, was I attacking him? No, you were just exploring. <clears throat> you, were, you were fishing for more information. Yeah, I think I was trying to do it objectively and curiously, but for some reason he takes it as an attack. Yes, because he thinks he thinks he thinks he's the target of the post that says smart people don't need to tell other people they're smart. That's right. And yet he thinks it's important for the common people to figure out who the smart people are. He says, How would they know? He's, he's making a point about whether or not you should blow your own horn, you know what I mean? Yep. Sometimes it's appropriate, and I, must, I think most of the time it's not. If your peers understand your level of uh, academic achievement, then you wouldn't need to blow your own horn. Right, Barry? I'm sorry, I was reading uh, the comments. Say that again. If you've reached a level of academic achievement uh, with your peer group, there's no need for you to be going around blowing your own horn. Yeah, that's considered bad taste and um, well, I guess worse than bad taste. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. It, it shows a uh, insecure ego or something. Or, or, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, I, I don't quite know how to characterize it, but it's it's an unbecoming practice. So did you read the thread, Barry? So I was just looking at it now. So let's see. So the first one that comes up is he posted just now two questions for the long time, but now very small active tribe of the GCC. But there's no comments on that one, so that can't be it. Let's go to the next one. Let's it's see. above that. Because I haven't even seen that comment yet. No, yeah, well, that was, that's timestamp quote just now. Let's see. Uh, find another one here. April 26, smart men don't tell you how smart they are. Rich men don't tell you how rich they are, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> How do the, oh yeah, this is the one you mentioned. How do the common folks recognize the ones that possess these qualities? Doesn't it take some form of investment in order to do so successfully? Sam Howell, I noticed some patterns in your postcard to elaborate. Thank you, Professor Marty. See, that's the kind of comment that I would just immediately dismiss and not even ponder, let alone attempt to respond to. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this like two weeks ago. What problems do you see? Not a problem with patterns. Stacy, hidden toxicity. Guys, what are your points, motives in attacking me instead of trying to figure out why I wrote? I have no idea why he writes anything. I don't, wouldn't <laughs> even attempt to figure it out. That would be beyond my faculties to try to diagnose psychology like his. You come, you're coming up towards my reply. How do the common folks recognize the ones that possess these qualities? Doesn't it take some form of successful investment? Is a matter of interpretation for each to digest. If you feed and feed a need to tell others these things, it could be due to any number of conditions related to the mind. Well, yeah, basically you're saying there's probably reasons, but who the hell knows what they are? Yeah. Are you yeah. promoting assumptions as a way of life with your comment here? See, this is why I will simply not engage with him. I would simply ignore him. I'd put him on ignore and not attend, and not respond. It's just, it's a losing proposition. I don't know what he's fishing for. I mean, I know that he was fishing for compliments. And once I figured out he was fishing for compliments, I kind of just began to- Well, you know, he signs off as Professor Marty. I know, and that's really annoying. himself a doctor, you know, in something. And he fired his faculty, so I'm guessing that means he didn't even graduate. So I think he definitely is seeking recognition and attention. Yeah. And I just want to know if you, and I, 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 I understand it may not be possibly, you know, objective for each of you, but as objectively as you can, 
I'm just wondering, did I overstep any boundaries? No. And no, did I, you know, no. become attacking in any way? No. I don't know what's wrong with him, but far be it for me to diagnose it and certainly not to treat him. I would, I just, I signed off on him a long time ago. Well, maybe three weeks, three or four weeks ago. But it's Stacy right? We, this was a week ago, unless they are insecure, that's exactly what they do. Yeah, so see, basically Stacy suggests, you know, insecurity, Joe Paris, if is related, realize insecure often means very traumatized. Yeah, it's plausible. Stacy says you're correct about that. Yeah. <clears throat> basically, I'm I, I I wouldn't even engage him. I, I think it's a losing proposition. Is there another one besides that? That's no, that's one. the thread that I was referring to. And yeah. I'm, by the way, not really directly engaging him, although I am. I'm really trying to draw out, you know, some um, possible consideration from everybody else who might be watching this thread. Well, like I say, well, I think it's a good proposition <clears throat> to, I mean, generally speaking, it's, it's problematic to psychologize other people, even though it's a pretty popular common thing to do it's off at least in my experience is fraught with difficulty and i'd rather not do it yes yeah, yeah i agree with that if you make assumptions but if you're exploring possibilities and mental models then that's still potentially positive in my mind well i mean if you're if you're into writing a little caricatures little sketches caricatures caricatures or character sketches you can use characters like that to seed um little imaginative character sketches but they don't purport to be anything other than a work of the imagination maybe for some amusement purposes but i'm not sure that's a smart thing to do either anyway thank you i just wanted a bit of a feedback on whether I'd uh, gone too far across some boundary. I don't think so. But nonetheless, um, I'd say I, I give that boundary a big margin, big yeah. margin, like an infinite margin. Well, <laughs> partly the reason I want to learn how to do that well is I still want to learn how to disagree well. And the way to really explore that is with people I disagree with or people who disagree with me. So that's partly why I want to try still pushing that boundary a little bit. Well, good luck. I mean, yeah. When you make errors, you learn something. So, and if there's, if there's no feedback, it's more difficult to understand the response you're looking for. You may have to dig deeper. Exactly. My parents, when I was a child, my parents used to say, if you can't say something nice about somebody, don't say anything at all. Uh, it's taken me decades to take that advice <laughs> to heart. That wasn't your parents, Barry. I think that was Thumper. Well, I <laughs> guess they were channeling Thumper then. I don't know. But... You know what I'm talking about? Well, Thumper was a children's character in some interesting. Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny. No, that... no, no. The Bambi movie. Come oh. on, guys. Oh. Anyhow, wherever they got it from, I don't know. Um, it took me a sort of a long time to learn to <laughs> be disciplined. And even then, I'm, you know, I slip and. I mean, I, I know that, you know, people, when you say something bad about someone behind their back and it, you know, it gets back to them, you know, what goes around comes around, there's sort of a, a general guideline against that, that's an unwise thing to do. Other than to simply say, you know, I, I simply don't engage that person because it's not fruitful or productive for whatever reason, you know, don't have to give a reason, just say it's not a fruitful enterprise. 
either if neither is learning from the other, and that's not uncommon, then why bother? Oh, somebody's coming in. Oh, Heiner's coming back. Okay. Yeah, I agree. And sometimes it's hard to tell that neither of us is learning. Well, it takes a long time because sometimes, you know, the learning process has this long pregnant pause before you have the aha. And if you go for a long enough time, you basically say, well, the uh, payoff isn't worth the time and investment. And you basically, you know, abandon the enterprise. It's, real, it's reality. I kind of disagree with that. If you lean in long enough and hard enough, you always learn something. Could be very painful though, too, and costly. Yeah, that could be. I've had, I've had lessons that I wish that wasn't worth the cost. <laughs> At least that obviously. I mean, people do become dispirited and depressed and despairing. And, you know, it, it's not that hard to get into a funk because you wasted so bloody much time on fruitless activities. Now that I'm aging, I, I really can't afford to spend a lot of time because I don't, you know, if there isn't any low hanging fruit, there probably isn't going to be any fruit at all at my age. I feel for you, Barry. Yeah. Don't grow old. It's no fun. Let's see. It's better than the alternative. Well, that's what they say. Although there's certainly plenty of people who have taken the other tact. Fork from Barry Clark Jekyll now. Build a Jekyll blog in minutes without touching the command line. I don't know what that is. I just got another notification that he guy Kim just mentioned me in another comment. Also in GCC. Don't take the bait. That's what the uh, my parents used to say. Don't take the bait. I didn't know what that meant for decades either. Um, let's see if I can find. I'm not finding anything new from what I looked at before. Maybe if I refresh the page. I'm not seeing anything new, Sam. I don't know where the newest comment is that you're referring to. Is it in GCC or is it somewhere else? Yeah, I think it's in that same thread, but I'm just probably now getting the notice that was previously put in. I see only something that was put in about nine minutes ago. I don't see anything more recent than that. Sometimes, you know, these Facebook notifications are not real time. They're not. And also, uh, Facebook isn't presenting the comments in time sequence anymore. They're often out of sequence. Which is are one you... reason I keep saying it's not good for threaded conversation. Oh. Are you promoting assumptions as a way of life with your comment here? See, I wouldn't even answer that. That's that. And I'm not even clear who he's responding to. Is he responding to Alex or is he responding to me there? Well, it is underneath, let's see, who's it? It's underneath his own. Oh no, it's underneath. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's underneath his own comment, underneath his own comment, so. I don't know. I don't think it's fruitful to try to parse that out and sort it out. I, it's certainly beyond my intellectual faculties to figure it out. Okay, but then uh, how about this? Let me at least entice you guys a little bit for next Saturday. I will probably try and prepare a bit better 
for a conversation around critical and systemic thinking next Saturday. That's fine. So I think that would be fun, especially if Heiner and you would both be there. And and if Stacy's back again. Yeah, that'll be good. I think she, I'm not sure if she'll be done with her house sitting travels or not by next week. I don't think she's mentioned. She should that. still have internet wherever she is. It would seem. Yeah, that's true. Although she may also have other activities while she's on the road. So who knows? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Heiner, are you going to be available next Saturday? Maybe. I cannot say. Anyway, that's what I think would be a fun topic to bring up next Saturday. I mark it red in my calendar. Yeah. How do you say calendar in German? Calendar. Okay. Calendar. I've got a message here from, from uh, Martin. He says, sorry, Alex, but I won't be joining another Facebook group at this time. Thank you. Anyway, the transcript of calendar is very bad. It is written like in English, but with a K. I would have guessed something like Wochenbuche or Tagebuche or something like that. Yeah, a Tagebuch. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, hey, I did not eat very much the last two days. I'm going to go and grab some food. I may rejoin you a little bit, but right, I think well, I'm going we, We've got a, a thing in the kitchen that's called a calendar, but it's not for looking up dates and days and weeks. It's for putting vegetables in and if you cook them, draining, we're draining veggies and oh, past, yeah. pasta. That's, that's, a, that's a colander with C-O-L-L, colander. Yeah. Oh, right. Col Colander, yeah. the strainer. I, I also have to leave. Um, excuse me. Okay, we'll see you when we see you, Heiner. Have a good one. I think um, we've lost um, Joshua as well. Yeah, Joshua. Oh, Joshua had to take a call from his sister. I think he said. And he uh, said he would be back after he took a call from his sister, which might be 20 minutes or something. Because I don't know whether his sister is uh, a parent or not, but if so, then it'd be a Mother's Day call. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, Engaging with somebody like that, Alex, I mean, you know, use your own judgment. But my preference is uh, run the other way as fast as you can. Yeah, well, I've got, a, I've got a habit of trying to draw people out <clears throat> when they speak. If they, if they show obvious signs of narcissism or uh, psychopathic uh, egotistical traits that, that, that are common amongst uh, people with severe forms of trauma. Yeah. There is, a, there is a DSM diagnosis that I learned about back in the 80s. They, they call it Axis 2 Cluster B. It's really personality disorders is I think the general term for it. And I learned about it um, after I encountered somebody who was a textbook case of borderline personality disorder, and I realized that I'm allergic to that kind of person, that, I, that I, I'm, it's very unwise for me to attempt to engage with anybody who has a clinical diagnosis of access to cluster B. And, and I, I don't know, I'm not sure what the population in the what percentage of the population have that diagnosis? But all I know is, as soon as I as soon as I get the uh, set signs that that's the kind of person, 
um, I, I want to flee. I want to disconnect. Yeah. Because I simply have no idea how to engage them productively or constructively. I see it I as a, it's an opportunity. You know, I see it as a, a chance to uh, to experiment with them. Well, yeah, except that I think there's some ethical issues of experimenting on people <laughs> without their consent, especially if you don't, if you're not trained in psychotherapy or. Well, when I say experiment, what I'm talking about is inter interacting. I'm just interacting, but every interaction with everyone I meet is an experimental one. In a sense, yeah. Yeah. you have to be very tactful. And I, I will be the first to admit that tact and diplomacy are not my long suit. I'm very poor at tact and diplomacy. And anybody who requires a great deal of tact and diplomacy, it's just going to be a disaster. I'm, yeah. I'm, just, not, I'm just not going to, it's not going to go well. I heard um, I heard Chris Hedges talking about uh, politicians and what a polit what political life is like, and he hit the nail on the head. He and he said that a politician is by their very nature a person who wants to promote the agenda they're carrying in their little bag of agendas and and aims, and and it all comes from the lobbyists who support them and fund them. Yeah. So they're, they're a mouthpiece for some other group. Yeah, I, I stay away from politics. I mean, it's like the plague. I stay away from politics like I stay away from the plague. It's just, it's not going to be a good use of my time. It's going to be very frustrating and uh, painful and unproductive. And I'll leave it to the politicians to you know, fight with each other because this is not yeah. the use of my time or brain power. I, I, and I like to encourage people to get out and vote uh, because our political power lies in that one vote. You, yeah. you're, you're a number when you do that. You, you get, your vote gets recorded somewhere. And, but in, in most democratic countries where they have compulsory voting, they have a very good uh, system of health care and uh, education and community services because everyone, all the people are voting, you know, even the, the, low, the lowly workers and servants, they will have to vote. And the, polit the politicians understand this big group of people who are workers. It's a very good system, but you don't have the democracy in the states. The the people that you voted for are selected by less than one percent of the. That's right. We're not. You're not really voting. I mean, I could see if we voted for values, uh, or maybe even projects or goals, but voting for people. I mean, yeah. how the you don't really know. What, you know, individual people are so complex. You don't really know what you're voting for if you're voting for people. Yeah, well, that's I would vote. I would vote for science. I would vote for education. I'd vote for health care. Yeah, um, I'd vote for infrastructure. A basic, a basic wage. Yeah. In, in in place of social welfare. Yeah. That would give people the money to go out and invest in a home or, some, or something. You know. But, uh, and that means the homes have to be built, so that creates work for all the tradies, plumbers, electricians, roofers, painters, carpenters, landscape gardeners. <laughs> so there we are. And I'm building. I'm building a hemp farm. When uh, when my book's published, I'll be straight out to the hemp farm to build a college of knowledge, uh, like a caravan park <coughs> or a, um, an eco village, eco ecological sustainability village with a college of knowledge to train people permaculture and, and self-sufficiency in their thinking, systems thinking for <laughs> young people who are messed up. I would certainly vote for 
upgrade of systems thinking in our culture, although I don't really know what that means when you try to reduce it to practice. I mean, I didn't really learn systems thinking until grad school. And there was a lot of applied math in the systems thinking that, that I studied in college. And mm. that's, I mean, that was, that's pretty rarefied material. It's challenging material. Not very many people were very good at it. Well, I began with the premise that the big system is everything, the whole thing, the whole shebang. Yeah, <laughs> it's all one big system. It is. And we take it, break it down from there and simplify it. It's like this argument I had with um, the Indian guy, I've forgotten his name. Oh, oh, I know what you mean, yeah. Um from England. We had we had a blue about nothing. <laughs> because he believed there was nothing before the Big Bang. He believed that was created by some intelligent thing called God. I was watching a video with Robert Penrose. There's a podcast called Closer to Truth. And Penrose was actually explaining a I wouldn't call it a theory because it's it's not really a, a theory, but but there is a mathematical way to imagine what preceded the Big Bang. Um, but it's hard to put into words because you have to use words to describe this abstract mathematics, which is doesn't do any, it does a disservice to the math. But he, he tried like the Dickens to explain that there is actually a mathematical model that you can entertain as to what preceded the Big Bang. It's not a very long video, I think about 10 minutes or so. But, uh, you know, it's, it's to I mean, it's just total speculation because there's no way to take a measurement to confirm or falsify the model. It's just that the mathematically you can't, it, it mathematically it hangs together. Well, no, if you can, if you, if you um, twist and turn enough with mathematics, you can make anything work. Well, it has to be consistent. And that's the point is he, he was able to come up with a consistent, but kind of startling model um, uh, that, that actually works. <laughs> this is, this know. is, this, this statement, nothing times two equals nothing. That's a consistent uh, mathematical equation and it proves that there was there was something here before the big bang yeah a catalyst yeah anyway it's it, you know it, it's a bit of i mean theory construction is a kind of a kind of work of creativity and which of course what you really want to do is construct a theory that's testable a lot of these theories are not testable, so they're just they're intellectual exercises, which might be amusing, yeah. but they don't actually lead to any. The fact that the universe is here is a, a sign that there was something here before. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, it, what 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 would have initiated it, the fact that we're here? Something had to initiate that. It had to be a yeah. catalyst. Yeah. The, so you know, if there was nothing here, the universe wouldn't be here either now. Well, it, be, it also it, begs the definition of what you mean by nothing, because... Uh, well, nothing means nothing. It means if, if there was no catalyst to start the universe, the Big Bang would not have occurred. So if nothing was the thing that was here before the Big Bang, then the Big Bang wouldn't have occurred. We wouldn't be here now talking. Yeah. Um, Penrose kind of stands that logic on its head, though, in a way that I'm not competent to articulate. But we think anyway. the, a lot of us think there's nothing in space, or right? the vacuum of space. But that's a Murphy. That's a Furby well, too. No, we know we know that there's uh, radiation in space. There's the Three degree background mm -hmm. radiation with permeate space, and the thing is that if there's a if there's a three degree background radiation, there's two things in space um, 
that are undeniable. One is gravitational fields and two is electromagnetic fields. Yeah. Light is simply the vibrations of the electromagnetic fields and gravitational waves are the vibrations of gravitational fields. And then you have to ask your question, if you have a gravitational field that's neutral or an electromagnetic field that's neutral, is it there? See, if, it can, if it cancels itself out, it's, it's there, but you can't detect it. So the point is, is that the presence of a, of a zeroed out gravitational field or zeroed out electromagnetic field can't really say that's nothing even though it's not it's not in there's no energy in it there's it's very low, low there's a minute amount because you know and if you put a container in space you've got to pressurize it otherwise it'll crush the vacuum of space will crush it if it's got matter yeah um <clears throat> if you don't if you depressurize an airplane it'll crush if you over pressure it over pressurize it the windows will pop out yeah, but you're talking about the presence of matter now. But in a vacuum of space, you don't have to have any matter. The tin can in the vacuum of space will be flattened if if the air if there's no air in it, if there's no pressure inside it, keeping it open, keeping it the walls apart from each other. Have you ever heard of the Casimir effect? Casimir yeah, effect yeah. actually the Casimir when effect. Two sets of actually, lines and you're interacting. The Casimir effect, which is measurable, I think overthrows that concept that you just articulated. If you, if you take two plates in the vacuum of space and put them closer together, the closer together they start pushing apart again because of the, the field in, in between the plates is actually has enough action to repel the plates when they get close together. And that's called the Casimir effect. I haven't really studied it, except that it's measurable. And would that apply to two objects that were circular uh, spheres, like two ball bearings? Because I've got a feeling that in the vacuum of space, matter would attract other matter. Well, it is. That's gravitational effect. Yeah. But see, the Casimir effect opposes. So the two plates would be gravitationally attracted, but the but the field in between them it repels them they're and interfering that, yeah and that that, that repulsion is caused by the the fact that the plates are interfering with the field that they're they're con they're confining the field anyhow i i'm certainly not the expert on this but if you look up casimir c a s i m i r casimir effect you'll find evidence measurable evidence to cast into question i think one of your working hypotheses but don't don't hold me to that. I'm just kind of recalling that as kind of an interesting yeah. physical observation. There's lot there's lots of um, what would I call them counterintuitive aspects to the things I believe are true. Absolutely, a lot of things are counterintuitive. Especially higher dimensional math is very counterintuitive. But just something as simple as the Dirac belt trick just knocks my socks off. And that's just higher dimensional geometry. Five dimensional. Yeah. I had enough trouble getting my head around three dimensional things. Well, that's because we live in three dimensional <laughs> space. <laughs> right. so, so our brains are adapted to reckoning three dimensional space. But theoretically, you could go to a, into a virtual reality that features four-dimensional space. And presumably, if you lived in it long enough, your brain would adapt to reasoning about four and five-dimensional space. But I don't know. I mean, this stuff is so esoteric that it even boggles my brain to try to reckon it. And I actually did, did mathematics in higher dimensional spaces. So I've been there. Not very intuitive. Well, I've attracted some interest in my um, Lynx Plus project, which is a, a, a sprouting. It's a sprouting from the uh, global challenges, and I think it. Um, I think it's through the uh, the publishing. I, I published a blog, which is a free a free chapter of my book. 
and uh, called chapter three. <laughs> three or three? It's called chapter three, as in one, two, three, and it's not. There's no charge for it, so it, it's also called chapter F R W E. Chapter three. Yeah. If they no, want to read everything I've published, is there's no fee. It's everything I publish on the internet. I just open yeah. and publish. I'm but gonna money, yeah. I'm gonna shut off that chapter four and onwards will be only available to people who have a a um a, subscription. A, no, a tribe membership in the uh, project, the Links Plus project. They have a top ten Links Plus page mm. of of their top ten links of all time. And uh, it's interesting to see what some people put up there. So I'm hoping that that might generate enough momentum for the Links Plus project to really take off. But it's hard to say at this stage. The people who understand the value of having a website are usually people who have already have other websites. And they know that the search engine optimizations improve by having a link on your website to another website where you have a, uh, an interest and yeah. you've got the description copied and you'd link to that website from your website. And then when the, when the search engines discover that link, it goes on a register somewhere. It improves the search engine optimization of, of your site. It means that it's easier for other people to find when they use Google or DuckDuckGoGo, whatever they use, search engines. They might be looking up global challenges and they'll come across these other sites. They'll also be listed as links. There's lots of, I couldn't find the GCC Facebook group when I searched for global challenges because there's so many other global challenges sites. It was buried. You know, I noticed that the that searching on Facebook has become increasingly erratic and slow. It's like if I want to bring up the GCC and I put in a search for it, it can take half a minute before Facebook mm -hmm. finds it and and provides me a link that actually works. A lot of times I click on a link and I it just sits there. I don't get anything. Also, I've noticed that the amount of traffic on Facebook is dwindling. Dwindling. That happened to my uh, Chris Hedges website when the war in Ukraine broke out. There's still some some of the comments, some of the posters are still getting 1500 comments a day. Yeah, which is, which is good. I, I noticed that a lot of a lot of my academic friends have migrated over to LinkedIn for conversations and are doing fewer and fewer conversations on Facebook. Yeah, I haven't really warmed up to LinkedIn that much. Yeah, it's. Uh... It's a very restrictive place for entrepreneurs, unless you've got money. If you've got heaps of money, there's lots of things there available you can join up to and subscribe to. But they're not within my range until I get my publisher on board with my book, and that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen unless I get some feedback. So that means I've got work to do. You know, send this link out to my uh, free free chapter, and see what happens. I might put it on the Chris Hedges site as a, over five thousand people there members, and do a bit of fishing. Yeah, I'll do a bit of fishing there. See if I can get some feedback. Well, I'm going to go and have, have, I'm going to go back and have a look at this um, site that Sam published at the uh, GitHub. Oh, the GitHub, yeah. Yeah, because I didn't get a chance to find out what it's about yet.
Okay. I only I copied your Jekyll and Hyde blog. You build a Jekyll blog in minutes without touching the command line. That means you must have a user interface. So <clears throat> I didn't get that. What was the Jekyll and Hyde thing about? It's uh, something you've got. Uh, you, you can build a blog in minutes without touching the command line. Yeah, but you said fork from Barry Clark. Who's Barry Clark? Oh, that's got the fork from Barry Clark, Jekyll now. I don't know who Barry Clark is. All right, it's not you. It's somebody. No, it's not Sam, me. It's not my last name. Somebody, Sam knows. Okay, I didn't. I didn't realize that wasn't you. All right. That um, that link, Barry Clark slash Jekyll now, is probably on a uh, GitHub page somewhere. Okay. Well, maybe it's somebody that Sam knows. I'll have a look when I get there because it's probably a link, probably a clickable link there. I can check it out. I'll find out. All right. See you later. Take care. All right. I, Sam, I will hang out here for, I don't know, maybe until 1215. And if nobody comes back, I'll just end the session in about 10 minutes.
Well, it's coming up on 1215 and nobody seems to have returned. Joshua has not returned from his sister. Sam evidently is still having breakfast. So, and Stacy's not here at all today. So I'm going to end the session, Sam, and we'll call it a Sunday. If you want to resume, you can always go back to Messenger and say you want to resume, but I'm, I'm assuming we're not going to. End meeting for all.